Good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's Trinity Forum evening conversation on God and Jihad, how ISIS and Al-Qaeda are transforming the Middle East. We're really excited to be able to partner with the Clement Center for History, Strategy, and Statecraft at the University of Texas at Austin in presenting a tonight's evening conversation on what promises to be a fascinating topic and certainly at a critical time. Tonight is actually the second in a series of four evening conversations that we are partnering with the Clement Center on, on the overarching theme of God and geopolitics, religion and national security in an era of instability. And our hope for this series is to provide a forum to explore and discuss the relationship between faith and foreign policy and the ways in which theology and our view of God affects geopolitical reality. Our first evening conversation in the series was held just six weeks ago, featuring Dr. William Inboden, who is both the director of the Clement Center for History, Strategy, and Statecraft, and I'm very proud to say a senior fellow of the Trinity Forum, who spoke on Reinhold Niebuhr, Christian realism, and religious freedom, and I'm pleased to announce tonight that we'll be holding two more evening conversations in this spring, which will feature Dr. Uh, Walter Russell Mead on religion and American foreign policy, and Dr. James Turner Johnson on just war theory and the contemporary security environment. So we will be announcing dates soon. Stay tuned and mark your calendar. And we're also delighted that each of you is here tonight on a very chilly, rainy, and generally gross evening. <laughs> so if you have friends who wanted to come tonight but couldn't make it, uh, we'll be recording tonight's evening conversation, which will be available by video um, on our website at www.ttf.org. And we're also going to be live blogging this event. And so you are welcome to add your comments or thoughts, as you think of them, both to our Facebook page and to our Twitter feed at hashtag Trinity Forum. For those of you who aren't familiar with the Trinity Forum, we work to provide a space and resources for the discussion of life's greatest questions in the context of faith. And we do this by providing readings and publications which draw upon classic works of literature to connect the timeless wisdom of the humanities with timely issues, and by sponsoring programs such as the one we're holding tonight to connect leading thinkers with thinking leaders in engaging life's biggest questions, and ultimately to come to better know the author of the answers. We also hold Socratic forums around the world, including an annual forum for Rhodes and Marshall Scholars at Rhodes House at Oxford, to enable to equip those leaders to grapple with those questions, to live and lead more wisely, and to connect history and the humanities with the here and now, and timeless truths with the issues of our day. And certainly, one of the great questions of our time is how to understand and confront those who would wage war against us, and indeed have waged not only war, but genocide against those who do not share their ideology and theology. Responding wisely and effectively to this threat necessarily requires an understanding of what motivates and animates ISIS and Al-Qaeda which in turn requires looking at their theology, their view of God and his followers, and the interaction between the theology and ideology that gave rise to jihadism. And there are few that can unpack those lessons with more expertise or insight than our speaker tonight, Dr. Mary Habeck. Dr. Mary Herbeck, for those of you who don't know her, is currently a visiting scholar at the American Enterprise Institute, as well as a senior fellow at the Foreign Policy Research Institute. She served as an associate professor at SICE, the Strategic Studies at John Hopkins, uh, the School of Advanced International Studies, where she taught courses on military history and strategic thought, and as well as teaching American and European history at Yale University, where re she received her PhD in history and her master's in international relations. In addition, Dr. Habeck is, was appointed by President Bush to the National Council of the Humanities, as well as a special advisor for NSC staff, where she served for several years. In addition to her books and articles on doctrine, World War I, and the Spanish Civil War, her publications include Knowing the Enemy, 
Jihadist Ideology in the War on Terror, which was published by Yale in 2005, as well as three forthcoming and not terribly cheery sequels, which include Attacking America, Al-Qaeda's Grand Strategy, which will be forthcoming by Basic Books this coming year, Managing Savagery, which will be coming out in 2016, and finally, Fighting the Enemy. Responding to Dr. Habeck tonight will be Dr. Paul Miller. Paul is the Associate Director of our partner, the Clement Center for History, Strategy, and Statecraft, as well as the author of Armed State Building, which was published by Cornell University. He previously served as a political scientist at the RAND Corporation, as well as the Director for Afghanistan and Pakistan on the National Security Council at the White House. He's also served as the professor at, National, at the National Defense University, where he developed and directed uh, the College of International Security Affairs South and Central Asia program, and worked as an analyst at the CIA, as well as serving in Afghanistan as a military intelligence analyst with the US Army. Dr. Miller holds a PhD in international relations and a BA in government from Georgetown University, as well as a master's degree from Harvard. His writing has appeared in Foreign Affairs, The National Interest, Studies in Intelligence, Presidential Studies Quarterly, and of course, the best-selling Small Wars and Insurgencies Journal. <laughs> At the conclusion of Dr. Habeck's remarks, Paul will offer a response, and then we'll have a longer time for audience questions and responses. Dr. Habeck, welcome. I could perhaps do this without my notes, but um, it'll be better organized if I have them. Um, <clears throat> before I begin, I'd like to apologize for two things. Um, first of all, for inflicting a PowerPoint slide on you, and uh, then secondly, for how quickly I'm going to be speaking tonight. Um, the talk uh, that I'm hoping to do for you uh, generally takes between 45 minutes and an hour, uh, but Paul has promised to start throwing things at me if I go over the time limit and um, don't give you all a chance to respond to what I have to say. So uh, what I'd like to do is sort of introduce you to the problem that ISIS and Al-Qaeda represent to the United States and then give us um, a look at what we've been doing so far in order to combat both of these groups and then provide at the very end a tiny little um, uh, glimpse of what perhaps we might be doing instead in order to better combat these two groups. Um, and my first remarks are probably going to take the, uh, the greatest amount of time because I feel that there are a lot of questions, um, um, very conflicted feelings about these two groups, and I think unpacking them and their relationship in particular um, with the world religion of Islam is um, one of those necessities uh, for this entire debate. So let me begin by giving you the problem that this uh, talk will help, I hope, to um, provide some illumination to. Here's where we were at in 2011 when it came to Al-Qaeda-linked terrorism. In some ways, 2011 was um, the heyday of our fight with Al-Qaeda. And as you can see, there were some countries that were suffering violence uh, from Al-Qaeda, all of them, of course, Muslim-majority countries. Um, one of the things that I, I should emphasize before I even begin unpacking these um, terribly complex questions is that eight times as many Muslims as non-Muslims have been killed by Al-Qaeda and ISIS in terrorist attacks, and something more like 25 to 50 times more Muslims have died in insurgencies carried out by Al-Qaeda and ISIS-linked groups. So as you can see, ISIS-linked terrorism was a problem, but only in a handful of countries. This is what the situation looked like in 2014. Um, many more countries suffering from uh, terrorism um, from either Al-Qaeda or ISIS. But that pales beside the problem of insurgencies. In 2011, there were three insurgencies that were somehow linked to Al-Qaeda and Al-Qaeda affiliates. This is the situation in 2014. What has happened between 2011 and 2014 
to cause this growth in violence. Well, tonight I'm going to make a series of proposals about why this has occurred. Um, it has to do with a lot of things. It has to do with actions taken by both of these groups. It has to do with huge events out there in the world. It has to do with our own actions, what we and others have been attempting to do in order to combat both of these groups as well. But in many ways, there were things going on like the Arab Spring, over which very few people had much control, that allowed Al-Qaeda and ISIS to grow in strength and power, to take advantage of chaotic situations, and be able to um, impose their vision on people looking for answers, um, but answers that um, ended up taking them in directions they did not expect. So the Arab Spring, in some ways, provides us with a kind of starting point for why things began to go in this direction. But there were many directions that the world could have gone in 2011. Many of us were very hopeful that it would go in a direction that would include um, an end to this kind of violence, an end to the appeal of Al-Qaeda, and in fact, the growth of political solutions for many of the problems of the Middle East and the Muslim-majority world. I remember uh, very much the hopes that many of us had about Egypt, about Tunisia, uh, even about Syria and Yemen, that they could provide this kind of beacon um, for the entire Muslim-majority world. The death of bin Laden, I think, added to that hope, right? Um, after all, the founder, the charismatic leader of the group, once he was gone, a lot of us thought um, maybe that'll be the end of, of the threat from al-Qaeda itself. And so while I've given you a few things that um, don't look so cheerful here, um, we need to remember that in 2011, many of us had a great deal of hope for the world. But there were actions that were taken by Al-Qaeda and its affiliate, and actions that were taken by ISIS to take advantage, as I said, of these events that began to push them in directions that were not as hopeful. And there were actions that were taken by various governments, um, like in Egypt or as in Syria, where Assad refused um, to allow his people to have a say in governance, or in Yemen, where a government uh, chose to fight back, that allowed um, violence, and especially those who are merchants of violence, like Al-Qaeda, to take advantage of these chaotic situations. And over time, to build followerships in places like Libya, or um, uh, others uh, like Syria or Iraq um, that were even seen as being very uh, good examples or places that could have provided good examples uh, for the rest of the Muslim majority world. But there's more to it than just the actions that were taken by Al Qaeda. There were also our own policies and our own decisions that also interacted with these and pushed them in directions that were not as hopeful as we had all um, begun with in 2011. Um, we chose, not this administration, but we, the American people, chose to leave Iraq. There was no outcry about this. There was no um, congressional meetings held there was no sort of um, st uh, stand taken against the decision to leave Iraq. We, the American people, chose uh, to leave Iraq, not just this administration. And the result was to allow a situation that had developed uh, from a civil war to slip back into civil war, and a situation that, therefore, Al-Qaeda and other uh, merchants of violence, as I've said, to take advantage of. We also, however, chose to believe with the death of Al-Qaeda that that was the end, and perhaps we could end this war and um, step down our involvement in the Muslim-majority world. Many, many people wanted to believe that Al-Qaeda had approached strategic defeat, and therefore we can withdraw from this war, uh, this war and concentrate on our own problems. If you'll remember in 2011, we were very war-weary we didn't want to be engaged in the world any longer. And voices especially that were speaking of things like isolationism began to get a very large hearing. Many people thought it's too complicated for us. We are doing more harm than good with our involvement, and it simply leads to more violence and more wars. We need to step away from this, deal with our own issues here at home, and not get so engaged um, in this mess. 
And a lot of that uh, was pushed by this feeling that Al-Qaeda was finished because of the death of Al-Qaeda, or excuse me, of bin Laden. Along with that, we began to define Al-Qaeda differently than we had previously. Before 2011, the United States had understood many of these problems as being connected around the world. And we had looked at places like um, Yemen or Somalia or other places um, far distant from Afghanistan and Pakistan and said there's some kind of connection between all of these things. But after the death of bin Laden, we began to separate the two and to say, no, maybe these are very separate local issues that can be dealt with um, through other means than our involvement. And maybe we can sort of disaggregate, was the term that many people used, these problems one from the other and focus instead just on keeping ourselves safe and secure. So a lot of the decisions that we made at that point about policy also helped in some ways to encourage and feed the growth and violence um, that we are encountering today. So where is this coming from though when we talk about Al Qaeda itself? How were they able to take advantage of this violence and push things in their direction? For the remainder of my talk, I'd like to talk about just three issues. What Al Qaeda and ISIS have been up to and how they have managed to take advantage of these issues. Secondly, how we've reacted to these changes, what we've been doing in order to manage this problem, as our president has said. And thirdly, what can be done more to deal with this situation that will not further exacerbate it? An easy series of questions to deal with in 35 minutes, right, Paul? <laughs> So what have ISIS and Al-Qaeda been up to? Well, first of all, you should know that I became interested in Islam as a great religion and as a strategic question back in the 1990s. So my first interest was not in the extremist at all. I was interested, in fact, in something called fiqh, which means jurisprudence, and in uh, theology and history of Islam. Um, so I, I feel like I know quite a bit about Islam as a religion, and I'm not going to talk about it tonight. Al-Qaeda is a very different problem from the religion of Islam. I'm also, by the way, not going to be talking about Islamism and Salafism. Those are also interesting questions. I could teach an entire seminar, uh, seminary, uh, seminar on this. This could, you know, um, a, a class at, at uh, SAIS or Yale. But um, these are huge questions. And by the way, Al-Qaeda is not really um, an Islamist or a Salafist group. Um, nor are they really just a jihadist group. No, it gets a little bit closer to where they're at. In fact, what they are is a tiny percentage of a tiny percentage of a small percentage of the Muslim majority world. A very tiny group of extremists who have decided that they understand what Islam is and they are going to force the rest of the Muslim majority world in their direction. That is, much of what is going on out there is not really about us at all. It's about the Muslim majority world. And it's about an attempt by this small group of people to take over and use Islam for their own purposes. So let me carefully distinguish for you some of the belief system that underlies this so you'll understand what they are up to in their fight, not just with us, but with the entire Muslim majority world. First of all, I want to distinguish what they believe from those, uh, the beliefs of people like Mursi or the Muslim Brotherhood. This would be an Islamist group, right? They believe that Islam has to have political power in some way, that Sharia has to be the law of the land. Um, but as you can see, they believe in something called dawah, that is in preaching and convincing people, persuading people through argumentation to join their side and not in the use of violence. And also, by the way, they don't have a particular form of Sharia that they use. They believe anybody's version of Sharia is perfectly fine. So that's why I say um, their vision of Sharia is in fact moderate. 
they have other things that are about them that show this sort of moderate trend. That is, they believe that Sufism is perfectly fine and they do not have a real beef um, with uh, the Shia side of the um, Islam question. On the other hand, these folks um, do have a little bit of a quibble with some parts of the Muslim majority world. They think that people have fallen away from true Islam and they need to be called back through dawah, not through jihad or violence. But they do believe that people need to change their behavior and people need to be more righteous, be more moral, need to follow, in other words, the Sharia more. In their vision of things though, the West is not blamed. They don't think the problem is with us in fact, it's an internal issue that we need to work with and deal with. Contrast them with these guys. This is a picture of Shabab, that is a, a part of Al-Qaeda. In their vision of things, um, Dawah is fine, but there is a place for a violence they call jihad. That there's no need to choose between who's to blame for the problems we face. We blame all Muslims, and we blame the entire rest of the world. So their violence is directed at everyone. They basically have created an enemies list of seven billion people. They believe that democracy is not just a bad idea, it's evil and needs to be destroyed. And every other thing that you look at here, you see this turn towards violence and destruction as the only answer for the problems that we believe um, or they believe the Muslim majority world is facing. If you take a look at those pictures, they also provide us with some clues about these three different groups and what they are up to. Mursi, President, ex-President Mursi of Egypt, is dressed in a European Western outfit, right? And his beard is very trimmed. His hair is, you know, just how he feels looks nice. Um, his image is, I'm reaching out to you. There is a place for the West in my life. On the other hand, um, the Salafis, and those are Salafis who are elected to uh, the uh, parliament in Egypt um, after 2011, the Salafis image, the long beard that's untrimmed, the very short hair on top, the um, uh, traditional looking outfits, what these say is we are authentic. We are authentic Muslims. We're presenting you with an image of what real Islam looks like. The third group are wearing outfits from another country. They're not wearing what people in Somalia generally wear. They're wearing, in fact, the shawlar kameez from Pakistan, Afghanistan. And they're wearing uniforms and carrying weapons. Their vision of themselves is, we are soldiers of a foreign army that happened to be in Somalia. That's the difference between three groups that are often sort of conflated, but there's another problem that's developed since 2013, and that is the difference between Al-Qaeda, who has, in fact, since 2011, begun to, and I hate to put it this way, moderate some of their harder edges, um, compared to uh, this group, um, this is a group that uh, is either the Inri Masiyun or the uh, Zabihat, I can't tell. Those are their shock troops, their storm troopers, or what they literally call their slaughterers, who are involved in the uh, genocide of people throughout the Middle East. And you can see they began to have a quarrel with Al-Qaeda that they were not being firm enough with outsiders were firm enough with other Muslims. And their quarrel was not, um, we need to moderate, their quarrel was we need to be more extreme. So ISIS should be seen as Al-Qaeda on steroids, an Al-Qaeda uh, with none of the breaks uh, that Zawahiri in particular has attempted to apply over the past three years. In fact, if you take a look at their ideology, you can see why they have carried out the actions they have over the past three years and beyond. Their ideology is based on taking good Islamic principles and giving them their own twist, and then continuing to use those terms as if they're talking about the same thing with other Muslims. 
do it repeatedly, do it repeatedly in order to convince other Muslims we're just like you. We believe the same things that you do, but always with that twist. Let me give you an example from this list, um, the term Tawheed, which is the core of the religion of Islam. It means there's one God and only he should be worshiped. Al-Qaeda has taken that term and said, and that's, that's good as far as you've gone, but actually Al-Qaeda means something else. It means that you should not just worship one God, you have to obey, obey him perfectly. And he's the only lawgiver. So if you're not obeying God perfectly, you're not really a Muslim. And beyond that, if you try to say that we should be making more laws than God has given us, you have turned yourself into a divinity. You've said, I know more than God. I know better than God. So democracy, and this is an actual book written by an Al-Qaeda supporter, is a foreign religion to Al-Qaeda. They have turned what is the core, the center of uh, Islam, into a political statement about democracy. Now, I have led you down a path, but there are perhaps some of you in the audience who are Christians that I can give you an analogous situation to that will help you to understand why this has been rejected out of hand by ordinary Muslims. Let's say that a group started up that said, um, in order to correctly worship God, um, we must understand that the Trinity implies that you have to have three branches of government. The president is God the Father, the legislator is God the, the, legislature is God the Son, and of course the Holy Spirit is uh, the, the, uh, um, the judicial branch, right? Inspiring it all. How many of you would find that, who are Christians, would find that a persuasive argument about what the Trinity really means for us? Yes. So in every single communication that is put out by Al-Qaeda and ISIS, every single one, you can go look, they bring you back to Tawheed and explain to Muslims again what Tawheed really means because Muslims are rejecting it. So that just by itself explains, one, why they reject democracy or a political solution to the problems of the Middle East. Two, why they believe they had to engage in violence. And three, why they believe most of the Muslim world is in fact not really Muslim and therefore can be killed in their violence. Just that one term alone. Um, but they also have some starting points that help to explain what we're dealing with in the Middle East today. Their self-image, the way they imagine themselves, and this is Al-Qaeda is, that there is no distinction between their high command or their general command, as they sometimes call it, uh, call it and all of those affiliates out there that are fighting with us. In the imagination and perhaps in the reality in some ways of Zawahiri, he is like the commander in chief of a very large army with field commands out there that are obeying his orders. And ISIS, therefore, is like a COCOM that's gone rogue and must be brought back into line. In their visions of things, they understand us as being weak, but weak not militarily, but in our economy and in our public opinion. And they believe in targeting those in order to attrit us, that is, to exhaust us and force us to do their will. And finally, they believe this is a really long war. They're in it for the long term. I've heard them talk about 200 years, multi-generational war. They have patience, they have persistence, and they're going to outlast us. They'll simply wait for us to give up and walk away. And they believe they're facing a global crusade. They play again and again the term used by George W. Bush in September of 2001 in order to convince other Muslims that there is a crusade that's been declared against the Muslim world and you are the target of it. And that therefore there has to be a global violence that they call jihad in order to confront this. ISIS has a slightly different self-image. They view themselves as the only legitimate government in the entire world. All other governments are illegitimate and should be overthrown. So their starting point is to overthrow all these other governments, and therefore their views about us 
are slightly different than those of Al-Qaeda. You see, their experience of the United States was back in 2009 and before, and they think the U.S. is militarily weak. The only reason they were kicked out or suppressed in Iraq and elsewhere was because of betrayal, internal betrayal by Muslims. And they've been taking it out on those Muslims as much as possible. Much of the violence in Anbar province, for instance, is aimed precisely at those who helped us during the Iraq war in order to get rid of this potential threat to them. And finally, they also agree with Al-Qaeda in many of the various pieces and parts here that this is a worldwide crusade that we have to bring everybody in to fight with us. But anybody who doesn't join them, any Muslims who refuse to swear an oath of loyalty called bayat to them, is no longer really a Muslim and needs to be fought and killed. Their enemies then, they define as fourfold and they rank them in general in this way. This is Al-Qaeda's vision at least. First, what they call literally the Jewish crusaders. For most of us, that's just a little much. But for them, it explains everything. Behind the president, behind everybody in the United States who's in power, or thinks they're in power, is actually the Jews running things. Yes. They have taken uh, the protocols of the elder of Zion as their operating manual for understanding the real enemy behind everything else. It, to read this is to, to, you can't believe somebody is actually believes the things that they say about how the United States actually runs. But why is the United States the main enemy? Why are they at the top of the list? Well, it's not because we're the strongest military in the world. It's not uh, because um, in their vision of things, uh, we're still occupying Saudi Arabia. Uh, actually, we've pretty much withdrawn, haven't we? Um, what, how did we become the main enemy? Well, the argument that was made by a man named Hazm el Madeni um, is that the United States is the main support for every single um, apostate ruler in the Muslim majority world. The United States props up the Mubaraks, the Sauds, all of the Muslim majority world's leaders, and we're the main support for Israel. If the United States is forced to leave our lands through attacks, the apostate rulers who are second on our list will easily fall. So they began attacking the United States, not precisely because they saw us as a military threat to them, but because they saw us as the main support for the apostate rulers, as they call them, of the Muslim majority world. And they hoped, once we had left, to take on these next in order. If you take a look then at their objectives, you can see how little of it has to do with us and how much of it has to do with this vision of the rest of the Muslim majority world that we need to first, of course, get rid of us. But we're sort of this annoyance, this botheration that prevents them from setting up their perfect state. And once we're gone, all will go well. ISIS also believes the same thing. In fact, they spend much less time even talking about us, uh, only began to talk about us whenever we carried out our airstrikes against them. To them as well, it's about the rest of the Muslim majority world. And finally, the means that they're using, if you take all of these means from Al-Qaeda and match them up with their ends, they match up perfectly. If you take the means here and match them up or try to match them up with the ends expressed by ISIS, they don't match at all. Their violence, 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 violence is their only answer, their only solution to all problems. Whereas Al-Qaeda has learned, they've changed. They've decided we need to make an appeal to the rest of the Muslim majority world and hope to get them somewhat, at least, on our side. Their plans, however, are very much the same. And if you take a look at how they think about the world, they believe that they need to follow precisely in the footsteps of Muhammad and his life. And so they are literally attempting to live out their vision, at least, of his life in the world, something called the Sirat Muhammad. If you also look at this, though, you'll notice something very interesting. They begin with an assumption in phase one 
that the entire Muslim majority world has fallen away from real Islam and has become a bunch of pagans again. That's the underlying assumption that allows them to say anyone who doesn't join us is really not a Muslim because they have all fallen back into ignorance and paganism. So how have we reacted to this threat, to all the things I've shown you, the, the, the violence, the ideology that's behind it, their vision of the world and what they want to create? Well, by and large, we have reacted by deciding to lead from behind. I take this very seriously because I do believe that this best expresses what the United States has been doing for the past three years. We have decided that our presence, it's us that causes most of the problems. This was, in fact, a theory that was held by Generals Casey and Abizade about Iraq in 2004 through 2006. They believed our presence in Iraq was causing the problem. If we simply withdrew from their cities and went off into big bases, there would be less violence. And we have taken up this concept that we're the cause of the problem and have decided to lead from behind. Instead, we have put forward and are helping and supporting a lot of different partners, not just in the Muslim majority world, but outside as well, like France, who is you know, helping to carry out, um, or was until very recently, the majority of the operations in northern Mali. Depending on partners has been on a national basis. We've disaggregated the problem. We've said all of those problems out there are not connected. We don't buy into Al Qaeda's self image, that they're the high command, that they're the general command of some sort of field army out there that's fighting underneath their orders. And instead, we've disaggregated it and said we're dealing with local problems, national problems that we can deal with one by one. And we have attempted to implement a concept where we just go looking for our enemies. We're not really interested in fixing the problems of the Muslim majority world. We're interested in keeping ourselves safe first. And that means we've chosen counterterrorism as our main methodology. Counterterrorism is based on attrition. That is simply killing off the members of the terrorist group. But if even half of what we've seen here is true, we're not really dealing any longer with a terrorist problem, are we? With insurgencies now in, half a, in a dozen different countries, can we say that terrorism is the main threat to peace around the world? Well, for uh, the US government, it's been enough. We can't fix all these problems. They're discrete problems. We can help as much as we can, but Really, uh, how, sh you know, how should we go about fixing all these problems ourselves? Really, what can we be doing? So it's enough to keep ourselves safe. And we've been using, as I said, attrition. That is simply killing off people as the way to do it. Allow me to provide just briefly a, a nothing's been thrown yet, um, <laughs> um, a, a proposal for thinking about the problem slightly differently. First of all, leading rather than leading from behind. Because it turns out if we do nothing, the world does nothing. Nobody steps up to take our place. Nobody feels empowered by our absence. Nobody says this is a problem for all of us and energizes the United Nations to go and deal with these problems. It turns out when we disappear, any chance of a solution disappears with us. Secondly, the concept of partners makes sense, but partners need more than simply being told, we empower you, go and deal with this, and God bless you, which seems to be what we're doing in most countries. We need greater engagement with our partners. And one of the things we need to be doing is helping them to understand the problem as more than just about terrorism. It's about insurgency and not just terrorism at this point. Thirdly, we need to see this not as just a national problem, but as regional problems. Iran and Iraq, or, sorry, Iraq and Syria are deeply connected, and they're deeply connected with a lot of other countries around them, from Iran to Lebanon 
down to uh, Jordan and northward. These are regional problems, not just national problems. If we attempt to deal with them on a state-by-state -state basis, we'll simply push the problem off into other countries. The problems in Mali, for instance, were simply pushed off into a lot of neighboring countries and then rebuilt and came back to Mali. More than that, some kind of connection is there between these regions, connections that every once in a while we get a little teeny glimpse of. For instance, how many of you were surprised by the sudden appearance of something called the Khurasan group in Iraq and this concept of an imminent threat that required the United States to carry out bombing runs? There was some speculation that this was simply made up or really wasn't a real thing. I went looking for the first uh, mention of the Khurasan group, and it was actually not in September. It was in July. Um, Peter Bergen, in fact, wrote a really nice article in July of this year in which he described the Khurasan group as basically a cell of high-level leaders from Al-Qaeda that had been sent to Syria to run the situation there. That's how he put it. More than that, we found out as well, because of this imminent threat, that there were connections between Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula and Syria. Regional is not big enough. There's something more going on. There are connections beyond even regions. And finally, my proposal for what we should be doing is to put people first. There's two basic ways to think about the problems we're facing especially when one is dealing with an insurgency. Allow me to give you an analogy that I use with my class. Let's imagine that you have a flock of sheep who are being infiltrated by wolves in sheep clothing. There's two ways you could deal with this problem. One is you could identify these guys and uh, send your, let's say, uh, German shepherd in there to deal with those wolves in sheep clothing as you identify them. That's basically what counterterrorism does. You identify an enemy and you take care of them, right? A second way to deal with it, though, is to have a sheepdog that actually just lives with the sheep. They get to know the sheep, the sheep get to trust them. After a while, they get to know who's a sheep and who's really a sheep in wolf's or a wolf in sheep's, uh, sheep's clothing, and they deal with them because they know them so well. It's more like a protective sort of thing. That's what counterinsurgency is. You get to know people, they get to trust you, you stick around, you're persistent and patient, and over time, you're able to figure out who's the bad guys and who's not. And you encourage the rest to take control of their own lives and to trust you as well. So persistence and patience, getting to know people and to work with people is all part of this. Um, concept of a counterinsurgency. But finally, I'd like to give you a little good news because gloom and doom need some good news at the end. This is actually working in Iraq right now. How many of you know the good news from Iraq? Hardly ever gets out. Still very bad situation in Syria, still dealing with um, uh, ISIS carrying out massacres of other Muslims right now in Anbar province, still some bad things going on. But the Iraqi government, mostly Shia, is working with the Sunnis in Anbar and elsewhere, and with our help is pushing back ISIS. Um, and by the way, the Kurds as well, is pushing back ISIS. They've been pushed away from the Yazidi areas, and when they made an attempt to come back, they were pushed out again. They've been put, mostly pushed out of um, several provinces um, where they had embedded themselves. In an Anbar province, they're making a sort of last stand there, um, but I, I have hopes for very good news from Anbar province as well in the next few days. Good news from Iraq. This concept, working together with partners, urging them to do more than simply targeting, that is to work with the population to have a people first kind of vision of things and a counterinsurgency mentality, it really does work. And we're seeing some of that happen right now in Iraq. Thank you.
I'm going to use one of your slides. All the way back to the beginning. That map was too good. That's right. Uh, thank you, Dr. Habeck, for your presentation. I've heard Dr. Habeck now give several presentations on related overlapping topics, and uh, I learn something new every time. Uh, so it's a testament to her knowledge, her expertise, and her skill as a public speaker, and we're very privileged to have heard from her tonight. So thank you. If I were to uh, approach uh, the President of the United States or the National Security Advisor with this map and with the presentation Dr. Habeck just gave, I might speculate that we have a couple of very big basic choices to make. We have two big options we could, we could pursue in reaction to a problem like this. And I'm going to simplify on purpose to, to give you an exaggerated version of these policy options. On the one hand, we could undertake a deliberate policy of endless war we could make a choice that the best response to this situation is to undertake uh, Abbottabad raids and drone strikes anywhere in the world uh, for the rest of time, and, uh, so long as we deem that there might be a terrorist out there who is a threat to, to American national security. We could simply arrogate that to ourselves as a right. As long as there's somebody that we deem, we, we designate to be a terrorist, we reserve the right to use lethal force at any time in the world uh, indefinitely. The other option is uh, to undertake very large, very difficult, very expensive campaigns of nation building. Uh, to attempt to transform the conditions in these places that gives rise to such groups that enables them to operate, that enables them to recruit, that feeds their ideologies. We could try to uh, transform the region. And these are our two basic choices. We can undertake endless war, or we can undertake nation building. Again, I'm exaggerating on purpose, but I think that's helpful for forcing us to think through the pros and the cons of each option. The disadvantages of nation building, I think we're all familiar with. It is very expensive. It is very hard. We all think that it has a long record of failure, although I'm going to challenge you that it's not quite as um, bad of record as we think it is. It's also presumptuous, isn't it, to try to change another country's political culture. Uh, as Dr. Habeck uh, mentioned, Al-Qaeda and ISIS view democracy as a foreign religion. And so in a sense, we're playing into their hands by uh, forcing our religion on them, uh, feeding into the narrative they're trying to tell. Uh, the advantages of endless war uh, are real. It is more cost effective. It is cheaper to simply fly drones around the world, to rely on special forces instead of large armies of occupation. It seems to be more realistic. Uh, as Dr. Habeck said, there is good news coming out of Iraq. Uh, it is even humble. Uh, that is to say, it doesn't try to do large, ambitious things. Uh, it sets its sights lower at merely physical protection of the homeland and will let the rest of the world sort itself out. Uh, we will concern ourselves only with our immediate, short-term physical interests, uh, and we won't attempt something grander than that. And, it prevents us from getting involved in a religious war. And so it seems attractive to pursue this option of endless war, of relying on special forces raids, drone strikes, homeland security uh, to solve this problem. It's essentially not to solve the problem, but to, just to keep ourselves safe while the rest of the world burns. Let me suggest some of the disadvantages of the endless war option. The goal of war is peace. Uh, as Augustine said, you fight a war in order to seek a better peace. And if the way we are approaching the terrorism problem does not lead to some definition of peace at the end of it, I would ask if that is consistent with what we understand to be just war. Can we say that we are approaching this with right intention as just war theorists talk about, 
if the way we approach this does not lead to peace at the end, or if the peace we seek is only the peace for ourselves, not the peace for uh, the rest of the world, for the parts of the world where the problem is the worst. As Dr. Hebeck said, most of the people being killed in this violence are fellow Muslims in those countries. And the peace that we are apparently seeking through our counterterrorism efforts is our own and not theirs. Uh, what sort of peace is there at the end of endless war? Uh, by the very contradiction in terms, you can see that there is no peace at the end of this. Uh, there may be good news out of Iraq, but I would suggest that this problem is almost certainly going to pop up somewhere else in the world. It's going to pop up again and again and again. If there's good news out of Iraq this year or next, there's almost certainly going to be bad news in Yemen uh, or Somalia or Nigeria or, of course, Afghanistan and Pakistan. And that leads me to suggest the advantages of the nation-building option. The advantage that, if successful, that option could actually lead to a just and lasting peace. Uh, yes, it's difficult. Yes, it's expensive. Um, we have a lot of learning to do. Uh, we have evidences of difficulties and even failures before our eyes in the last 13 years. But the advantage of this option is, if it is successful, it seems to address the underlying conditions that creates this endemic, perennial, persistent problem that seems to have no other solution. Uh, Dr. Habeck said, we chose to leave Iraq. Those are very convicting words. That suggests that what we see on maps like this are indeed partly of our own doing. And so we have a choice again today. We have a choice in Iraq. We have a choice in Syria. And yes, we have a choice in Afghanistan still. And the question is, what choice will we make? And what peace will we seek? Thank you. Well, thank you, Mary and Paul, for some very thoughtful and provocative remarks. Certainly a lot of food for thought, a lot to chew on. And so the last part of our evening conversation, we really just want to open this up to a discussion and question time. Uh, very few rules. The only rules there are is to make your questions a one-part, not a three-part question, uh, all in the form of a question. Um, also, we'll just, if you could wait until the microphone comes to you, I believe... Um, James will have the, we just want to capture it for uh, our video. Any questions? Yes, right over here. Based on your analysis, I'm curious as to your assessment, thoughts, as to how it is that the ISIS, as you've characterized them, have somehow grabbed at a level that AQ never did, at least not at the same level, of mobilizing the Islamic youth to come join this whatever it is they're about. And, and what does that imply about our potential uh, necessary elements to address some of that? That's, a, that's an excellent question because um, uh, certainly during the summer and fall we have seen um, lots of uh, both foreign fighters and uh, young people from around the, the Muslim majority world um, seemingly head off um, in their um, thousands according at least to the Syrian Observatory for Human Rights who does a fantastic job of, of keeping track of this. Um, to join up with, uh, by the way, both ISIS and Al-Qaeda. Um, but ISIS in particular has, um, has something going for them that I think has enabled them to make an appeal, um, especially to young people. Um, anyone, I think, between the ages of 16 and 24 is, tends to be at least, um, rather idealistic. And you want to do something big, you want to do something for a cause, you want to believe in something and really make a difference in the world. And ISIS, the, the picture, the image they're putting out is, we have created what you have been dreaming about and what your parents and grandparents have been dreaming about. We've created the caliphate. 
Come and support the caliphate. We're under assault from everybody else in the entire world. This is a cause worth supporting. And so I think one of their big appeals has been simply the creation of the caliphate. They've also shown themselves to be very adept at using social media. Um, they own Twitter, for instance. And um, there are you know, all sorts of guys out there. There's uh, several people, um, um, Aaron Zellin, uh, J.M. Berger, I can name a half dozen people who do a fantastic job of following how ISIS uses social media. Uh, Rita Katz at uh, Sight and Tell how they use social media in order to mobilize people. And the sorts of language they use are that, about a cause, an idealistic cause, that will, um, you, is worth sacrificing your life for. Joe Laconte. Uh, Joe Laconte with the King's College in New York City. Terrific uh, presentations, Mary and Paul. Thank you so much for that. I want to just kind of throw this question out about nation building and how to defeat this threat a bit. Because it seems to me when we think about some historical parallels, perhaps, with fascism, German fascism, Japanese, the Japanese version of it, we didn't really do nation building until that fascist ideology was completely militarily defeated and demoralized. I mean completely defeated. There was no chance of a resurrection militarily of those ideologies. We're, we're nowhere near that stage now with ISIS and Al-Qaeda. So I'm deeply dubious about nation building until there is a military defeat because success breeds success with these guys, it seems. They're drawn to the thing because it's, it's succeeding. They're, they're taking so much territory. How do we militarily defeat them? I, I think that's really the question before we get into the nation building. I'll take, I'll take a stab. Okay. Uh, I don't think the problem in Iraq is that we failed to blow up enough stuff. Um, I, I think that we, we blew up enough stuff and we achieved a, a catastrophic military victory in early 2003, and the failure was that we did not take advantage of the, of the golden hour. We failed to establish security in Iraq. So if there was a failure of uh, our military effort there, it was... Um, our sort of moral absence from providing order in Iraq uh, in the six months after the fall of the Ba'athist regime. That's what I think allowed the insurgency to, to grow, foreign fighters to enter Iraq, uh, start their campaign of terrorism and insurgency. Uh, if we had understood our responsibilities more seriously and done, yes, more nation building immediately after the fall of the Iraqi government, I think it could have forestalled, even deterred much of what came later. So if I could just add to that, I, I find myself nodding my head in agreement that, uh, with both of you. So let me attempt to square that, <laughs> that circle. So first of all, I think in a sort of grand strategic sense, nation building um, that is creating legitimate and uh, competent and responsive government, um, or not creating, but helping people to, um, uh, to achieve that is really important. Um, but uh, right now, we are dealing with such a terrible security situation that you have to, you have to do something about um, the, uh, the terrible violence going on. So this is why my proposal is uh, first deal with the violence, and then you can um, hope to implement a long-term solution um, that will prevent it from coming back. Um, a lot of people have pointed out that okay, this looked like it was working pretty well in Iraq in 2011, but the minute we stepped out the door, it wound itself back up again and the violence simply uh, reappeared. Um, the analogy I guess I would use here is probably Bosnia, because what you had in Iraq was not just an insurgency that was run by Al-Qaeda or other people. What you had instead was an insurgency plus a civil war. And there had been so much violence on a, on a communal basis, um, everybody knows that once you've had that sort of neighbors turning against neighbors, you have to have some kind of honest broker to stand in the middle for a generation. So if we had done the same thing in Bosnia, let's say in 1999, we signed the accords, we said, eh, that's enough for us, we're you know, spending too much money in Bosnia, we're gonna leave. I, I can absolutely guarantee within two or three years it would have spun out of control in precisely the same way. We're still in Bosnia, you know? 
And we're there for a reason, because the minute we, the honest brokers, walk away, it will spiral out of control in Bosnia. So unfortunately, because of the violence that um, both communities um, engaged in against each other, they cannot trust each other, and it probably won't be true, they won't be able to trust each other really for a generation. Now, I'm very encouraged by the fact that Sunnis and Shia are working together in many of these places in order to take on a defeat. Um, Al-Qaeda, and I've, I've already mentioned you know, some of the very hopeful things, but there have also been some atrocities carried out by Shia militia in retaliation for things that were done by ISIS and Al-Qaeda in Iraq. And that's just a tiny foretaste of what might happen if we once again decide to walk away. Yeah, Frank, second row here. Hi, thank you. I'm Frank here, Preston. Thank you both for a great presentation. Dr. Miller, you piqued my interest when you said that you're going to disabuse us of the idea that nation building usually fails. We have many examples from history where nation building has not gone that well. Can you give us some examples where nation building has been successful? Thank you. Um, yeah, I would, uh, so to, to use the more, uh, to use the terminology that um, is preferred in the universities and the State Department, it, we're, I'm talking about reconstruction and stabilization operations, what the military calls stability operations, what the UN calls peace operations. Uh, and there's actually been a, a string of pretty low profile successes since the end of the Cold War, starting with Namibia and Mozambique and Nicaragua, Guatemala, I would add Bosnia and Kosovo. I would say Sierra Leone became a success after the British intervention in 2002. Uh, Liberia, the second time around, not the mid-90s intervention, but the one more recently, has actually worked out okay. Haiti, sort of. Um, and and I, I, I will acknowledge, I'm using as a bar for success, uh, have the international community successfully changed the trajectory of a failed state? That's, I think, all we can really do. It doesn't mean we bring them up to the level of Switzerland or Belgium. It just means have we stopped the cycle of violence, poverty, uh, destruction, brokenness. And I think we have done that in a, in a pretty impressive list of cases since the end of the Cold War. Yes, there have been dramatic failures like in Angola, Somalia, I'd say Iraq, uh, but uh, we have had successes as well. Okay, Hannah. Yeah, I guess this is sort of a more historical question. To what extent would you say that some of the problems we're dealing with today have their origin or not in some of the nonsensical borderlines that were drawn by Sykes-Picot and also the withdrawal of the British in the mid 20th century? Please. Um. There, there have been... What Sykes-Picot? Oh, Sykes-Picot was one of the um, um, sort of concluding uh, treaties that everybody kind of wraps up as the, the Versailles treaties or, you know, there was a, actually a, a huge number of treaties that were concluded individually with um, each one of the powers, um, each one of the central powers at the end of World War I. And Sykes-Picot was one of the um, sort of addendum to um, these treaties. So, um, and it uh, divided up uh, the Middle East basically between the French and uh, the British and created um, lines on the map that had more to do with their interests than with the interests of the people um, in those places. Um, so, uh, constantly cited by Al Qaeda and ISIS as something that needs to be undone. Um, but it's not just uh, Sykes-Picot that they hate. They hate all borders and boundaries. And in fact, both of them have stated repeatedly that in the coming caliphate, there will be no borders because it'll be constantly expanding. As I noted on my, my list of things they hope to achieve, world conquest actually ends the list. So in their vision of things, having a, calif a caliphate that includes even all those places that are marked out in green on that map is not enough. Yeah. Can I piggyback on that? Oh, yes. Yeah. Um, whether the, the borders may be a problem. They may contribute to the problem. Maybe not. I think the worst thing would be for the U.S. government or any other European government to have a policy to redraw the borders and make them better. It's not our, it is not ours to draw. If the, and I would actually apply this to Ukraine as well, 
you know, if the Ukrainians wanted to uh, partition their own country, if the Crimeans had a free and fair vote, let them go, that's fine. The problem is when outside powers try to do that by force. Uh, and by no means, I don't think we should be in the business of saying, I think your borders would be better drawn this way. That's just a, not, not a, a wise approach um, to solving whatever problem may exist with the borders. I wanted to broaden the conversation a little bit to the majority of these Muslim majority countries. To what degree is it a factor in foreign policy and in their, broadly speaking, views of us that we may not have appeared from their perspective to live up to the ideals that we should have as supposedly Christian countries? Is that a factor at all? Um, it's not something that I've seen mentioned. Uh, first of all, um, I have, I've never seen any polling data on this, so I, I, I probably am uh, not going to be able to state with any kind of certainty that this is not a conversation that's being had. But in, in addition, I've never seen this raised as, as a problem um, by uh, Muslim colleagues or friends. So. Um, there's very mixed feelings about the United States. Um, if you look at the polling data, it says we don't want the United States boots on the ground in our countries, but we do want the United States to be engaged and involved in helping us. So the example of Iraq or elsewhere has not, um, it has, I think, convinced uh, the majority of Muslims around the world that this is, we don't want American boots heavily on the ground sort of fixing our problems. But we do want somehow the United States engaged. Um, there's a lot of other things going on though. If you take a look at the, the, uh, the polling data, there's literally uh, such a tiny, teeny percentage that have any sort of support at all for ISIS. It's uh, vanishingly small. But one of the things that um, we military historians understand is you do not need to have 51% of a country on your side in order to carry out a successful insurgency. In fact, what you need is between 5 and 10%. That's it. And you can run a successful insurgency. So that, that makes, I think, it a little more comprehensible how um, a group, a rather small group like ISIS, um, can carry out this kind of successful military campaign and then afterward use violence and intimidation um, to force people to do what they want. Uh, one of the things I send around to my students is a, um, a certificate of being a non uh, kefir That is a certificate of not being an infidel that apparently everyone in Raqqa, the capital of the caliphate, has to have. And it says on it that you have gone through a course of repentance and are now no longer um, um, an infidel. So this is Muslims have to do this. It's only good for three months. <laughs> and this was issued, the one, the one example that I found online was issued to a man. It said, this will keep you safe from lashings, crucifixion, and being raped. And the form that was used there was rape him, which is very, there's a huge difference in Arabic between rape her and rape him. So this was meant for men. I was, I was stunned, but it says something about what's going on behind, you know, sort of the, the terrible border um, with ordinary Muslims in ISIS territory. Paul, anything yeah. to add? All right. Other questions? Richard. Is there any sense in which ISIS is simply a snapshot of Al-Qaeda, say, circa 1991? In other words, I, I hate to use the word moderation in connection with ISIS, but is there any chance or possibility that they, they run the same trajectory of s relative moderation? Yeah. Um, my, my vision of ISIS is that these are the people who thought that Zarqawi had it right or in other countries who believe that, um, for instance, um, there's a small group in Algeria, and I've wondered if it might appeal to people in Algeria who had engaged in the violence that uh, Gia did back in the 1990s, the same kind of sort of unlimited violence. Um, I think 
what happens is, if you're the kind of person who's engaged in that kind of violence and believes you were justified in doing so, you don't want to hear from Zawahiri that we should be protecting Muslim blood, which is something he's put out as a message since 2011, that you shouldn't be indiscriminately slaughtering people, okay? Because that is actually a condemnation of you and what you have done in the past. It nullifies your jihad. It says you're going to hell. So when um, Zawahiri decided to moderate and began putting out these, these sorts of statements of reaching out and Dawa and all these other things, and I, I have some grave doubts that that actually has led to much moderation of Al-Qaeda's behavior, but you know, that's another uh, conversation perhaps. That, was, that might be seen if you were the kind of person who had agreed with Zarqawi and what he had done in Iraq in you know, 2004 through 2006 as an attack on you. I forgot. So I didn't answer your question. So I guess my point is there's some small group that once they've engaged in that violence, I don't think they're going to be able to moderate because that would be to criticize themselves. Um, Josh Newell, thank you very much for the, your comments. Um, I really enjoyed your point that all these insurgencies aren't simply localized, that they are connected in some way. Um, and I, I look at, say, Al-Qaeda in Yemen, um, which hasn't gained the foothold quite as ISIS has, or Ansar Bates and Maktis in Egypt, or groups in Algeria or Tunisia. And would you say that they're in different stages of the same, I guess, uh, ideology issues? And, or would you say that there actually are different issues? And mm -hmm. if so, as they are um, not as um, developed as, say, ISIS or Al-Qaeda in, in Afghanistan, what should be done um, to, to make sure that it doesn't happen um, going yeah. forward? Um, I do have a few thoughts on that, but. Well, my, um, I guess my, um, my reaction to that is um, what I put up is sort of an ideal and what I would call actually, you know, more militarily accurate to call doctrine, what you believe needs to be done or should be done to be modified according to circumstances. And absolutely, if you look at the rhetoric that is used by these different groups, you can see them emphasizing at different times um, different pieces, parts of this sort of doctrine. And so um, my assumption is that um, they believe that uh, each group is moving through these stages, but at their own pace. That's what I would say. And this is an issue that um, is regularly talked about in, co in the context of Afghanistan, Pakistan, the Taliban and Al-Qaeda, because they are both jihadist groups. One of them is far more locally oriented, one is more globally oriented. Uh, the question is, should we see the Taliban as a threat to American national security? Could we actually make peace with them so long as they denounce Al-Qaeda? Uh, and that depends upon your understanding of Taliban ideology. Would they indeed be content with just reconquering Afghanistan, would that be a threat to the United States? And I think what it comes down to is, uh, my, my judgment is, uh, the, the Taliban itself, you know, it wouldn't be Taliban foot soldiers attacking the United States, but they almost certainly would be amenable to renewed safe haven for groups like Al-Qaeda or the Islamic State or whoever comes next. And so you kind of have to understand there's a blurring of these kind of groups together anyway. Um, one of the mistakes we made in the Cold War was treating all communist movements the same, and that was wrong. We don't want to do that this time. We don't want to treat all jihadist groups the same, understand they're different, but when the rubber meets the road, they, they do kind of cooperate at the tactical level, and we need to approach our response to them with that understanding. A last question right there. Good evening and thank you. This is a general overall question and I hope maybe it will be helpful. Are there seeds of destruction within these groups that may be operative you know, in a reasonable amount of time? Secondly, how can we keep uh, the United States focused on this issue? Um, uh, I, I believe absolutely. ISIS in particular is um, creating, I think, uh, just as many enemies 
as it is you know, conquering. So even within its own borders, um, I'm carefully watching. Um, there's lots of news reports about uh, uprisings, for instance, in Raqqa, um, groups carrying out um, some sorts of attacks inside Mosul, um, all sorts of things um, like this ever since they've taken over these areas. So I think ISIS in particular is showing that their sort of unlimited violence is being rejected. Unfortunately, they're simply um, far more ruthless than anybody else. So what has happened, for instance, with um, some of the tribal figures who have risen up against them in Syria? Um, the Shulaitat, who are a group in um, eastern, eastern Syria, right on the border with, uh, with Iraq, uh, apparently objected to them, and um, I don't know how many thousands have been slaughtered or forced, and, and the, the rest of the tribe apparently has been forced into exile um, from around Deir ez So um, heat, um, which was held by a tribe that was very inimical to their ideas, uh, was taken over in October, and immediately there were reports of hundreds of people being killed, and 200,000 people um, pushed into um, um, into fleeing. So people do are rejecting them, want to reject them, but their, their level of violence that they are willing to bring to bear suggests to me that even if there's rejection from within, they're going to need external help. And when it comes to Al-Qaeda, I point out that all of the places where they've managed, um, one of their affiliates has managed to embed themselves, let's say like in Somalia or Yemen or even the Taliban in Afghanistan. Um, northern uh, Mali and so on, it has required um, external intervention in order to stop them and to push back their gains. So at no, in no example that we can point to has um, the people themselves acting themselves been able to uh, defeat these groups. I, uh, I would suggest that the Nazis also had the seeds of their own destruction within them, but they were able to uh, inflict a lot of damage on a lot of other people before they destroyed themselves. Uh, so we should keep that in mind. Um, how can the United States pay attention to this? Well, Dr. Habeck said, we made a choice about Iraq. Uh, there were no congressional investigations. There was no outcry. There were no letters to the editor. Um, I would just point out that we are making that choice right now in Afghanistan. Um, so maybe it's time for an outcry. Mary Paul, thank you so much for your very thoughtful. I know there are more questions and there is time. We do try to get you on in a timely manner. If you were one of the people whose question was not answered, you do have options. One, you can register your comment on our Twitter feed. Two, the bar will be open and you can snag the speakers over a drink. I want to thank all of you for coming. You should see on your chair an invitation to join the Trinity Forum Society, which we would strongly encourage you to avail yourself of. It is the members of our society that make evening conversations like tonight possible uh, and help support not only this event, but the mission of the Trinity Forum. We also make available to all of our members several different benefits of membership, including not only invitations to events like this, but also quarterly readings that we publish, such as our recent one on Vaclav Havel, uh, as well as our daily curated reading feed, What We're Reading. Other matters as well, and also it's part of an opportunity, part of a community that likes to think together seriously about life's biggest questions in the context of faith. And so we encourage you and invite you to join us in that. There's several people to thank for tonight. I'd like to thank my very able, uh, as well as winsome and wise uh, colleagues of the Trinity Forum, Margaret Eberly, our event coordinator, Rebecca Good, our development director, Chloe Cuffel, our editor, executive assistant, manager, scheduler, uh, and so on, as well as our Cracker Jack interns, James Cooper, Stuart Spooner, and Nathan Tolls. I'd also like to just give a special thanks to Paul and to the Clement Center, who are our partners in this effort. It's been a real pleasure working with you, and we're big fans of what you're doing there. Uh, the director of the Clement Center, Will Inboden, couldn't be with us tonight because he just became a father this morning. Uh, so uh, we will miss him, but are delighted that you're here, Paul, and, and, and filling in, and a real pleasure to partner with you. Finally, thank you for each of you for coming, and the bar will be open. Good night. <laughs>